Hello, everybody, and welcome. Good evening to our October edition of the Phosphorescence Poetry Reading Series. Tonight is, in fact, the final program of our monthly series, which has been running since May, bringing you some of the most exciting contemporary poets we know who have caught the spark of Emily Dickinson's own phosphorescent light. It has been a remarkable year of the series, and we want to thank all of the poets who have joined us here in this Dickinson parlor, as well as all of you who have followed this series and supported us from afar. Thank you for being with us, and thanks for being here tonight. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm Senior Program Director at the Emily Dickinson Museum here. And before I introduce tonight's poets, I have just a few words of Zoom housekeeping for you. We'd like to encourage you to use the chat feature of Zoom tonight, if you would, to share your affirmations and appreciation for these remarkable poets. They won't see your comments until after this program ends, but we will share that with them, and it does become a really special record of our time together. So uh, chime in, tune in, and you can do so now and let us know where you're coming from today. And then also tonight's readings will be followed by a conversation with a Q&A. So we would love for you to share your questions. Think about that while you're hearing the readings, um, images that you're, you're hearing in these poems, um, process questions, questions about craft or inspiration, all very welcome. So put those into the typed Q&A feature of your Zoom toolbar, if you would. And I'll be looking for those at the end of the, of the night here. Uh, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce this wonderful trio of poets. <laughs> so first we are going to hear from Kristen Hill, who is the author of How Her Spirit Got Out, which received the 2017 Jean Pedrick Chapbook Prize. And her work has been featured in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, in Poetry Magazine, Tank, Up the Staircase Quarterly, Winter, Tangerine Review and elsewhere. She's the recipient of the 2016 St. Batolph's Club Foundation Emerging Artist Award and the 2020 Mass Cultural Council Poetry Fellowship and the 2023 Vermont Studio Center Residency. After we hear from Kristen, we will hear from Demisty Bellinger whose debut novel is New to Liberty. She's also written two volumes of poetry Peculiar Heritage and Rubbing Elbows, as well as appearing in anthologies and publishing pedagogy and nonfiction. And Misty is an alumni reader at Prairie Schooner and professor at Fitchburg State University. Last but not least, we will hear from Allison Adair, the, who wrote uh, the, and her book, The Clearing, was selected by Henry Cole for the Max Ritbo Poetry Prize, was named a New York Times New and Noteworthy Book. And Allison's poems appear in American Poetry Review, Best American Poetry, Kenyon Review, Three Penny, and Ziziba. And her work <laughs> has been honored with the Pushkar Prize, Florida Review Editors Award, Orlando Prize, Mass Cultural Council Grant, and first place in the Fine Line Competition for Mid American Review. Originally from central Pennsylvania, Allison now teaches at Boston College. We're so lucky to have all three of these poets here on the East Coast, just a couple short hours from the Emily Dickinson Museum. So thank you so much again to all of you for being with us. I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you, Kristen. Hi, all right. All right, something's telling me to start um, with this poem about childhood. Um, I should say that like I lived in the inner city, but nature was like all around us. Um, and uh, this was just one experience with nature that left an impression on me. When I was a little girl, I snuck through my fence to a vacant lot close to my house to see sunflowers eating their way out of a frame of a burned out car, someone scorched rather than tow. I wasn't supposed to be that far from the yard and risk my ass to see the miracle that grew through skeleton of rust to make a broken thing useful again. 
If the sunflowers could find their way, could flourish in the damp soil made from composted car seat and stretch for the light they needed. And if they persisted unbidden, then I wanted to make my mouth, my hands, my whole self a vehicle those sunflowers could make a home in. We were talking about this home in the way here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's called Little Death. Little Death. If the sun hadn't caught on their iridescent eyes, I wouldn't have seen the pair of mantises hiding in the body of the shrub. Their accordion backsides attached like a finger trap. Sharp bent arms like open straight razors in the air. I ran for mama inside, pulled her into the clinging heat to see the monsters. She squinted, held her breath. They're dancing, she said, <laughs> and turned to go. <laughs> but why aren't their legs moving, I asked. She shrugged. Dancing is different for everything. My cousin and I often sat in the dark living room when everyone was asleep to watch soft pores on cable, our faces so close to the screen we could smell the static. We turn our heads at the muted mouths, squirming against their dance partners, staring into the painful O of women's mouths. I wanted them to run. Wondered why even we stayed until our eyes hurt from looking at the desperate bodies trying not to come loose. I wanted to know how this was done, how things joined and parted. I went to the kitchen for a jar, broke a piece of the shrug they clung to, slid them inside the mouth and twisted the lid shut, tilted their prison in my hand to see if they'd come apart. I got bored with their stillness, left them on the steps of the porch to watch cartoons, remembered late afternoon, didn't think about the weather inside a jar left in the sun. Their bodies yellowed, eyes fried black, their stiff conjoined form rang like a quiet bell when I shook it. I'd never killed anything before. Through the evidence in the weeds behind my house, heard a shattering somewhere in the thickness and went back inside. Wasps. Wasps nesting under the front porch make the floor sing under my feet. I know they could swell me shut, but I hold my palms to the door that separates us to feel their warning, not because I'm not afraid, but because I imagine a music box. Winged bodies circling in their colony, eating deeper into the house my Black grandmother built for her children, making another heart on the other side of mine. Did you know wasp nests take the shape of the objects they claim? Fill their gaps with dead fiber and spit into the places they were are swallowed in paper. So there's a lot of like nature going on, but also a lot of just like discovery and like just investigating the danger of nature. Um, and this poem appropriate enough is called The Wounded Deer. Um, we were talking about how appropriate that was on the, on the drive up. Um, and this is after Frida Kahlo um, and Morgan Parker, but also that, that Dickinson is definitely in this somewhere. Hunters stay fluent in damage. They stay hungry to read your insides. You stay half woman, half deer, tired from seeding the language of your blood on terrain. You stay stalked only this time in a clearing, wearing arrows like a crooked smile up your back. Your body stay a holy book of suffering and other things they will take later. For now, drawn to your leaping heart because it stay exposed and don't trust the cover of brush with its dying. The last time a hunter asked you, do you wanna die? You were on your way to something you loved. 
You said, fine, but I'll take you with me. What's left but to lift your resolve? Float it like a ghost that knows the wilderness, like it was you in another life. When they stay after you, why are they mad when you sharpen like your mama's good kitchen knife? Let them be mad then. Keep your glare armed, pointed at whatever wants you dead. Two more. This is a poem about grief. Um, there was a beautiful tree in our backyard on the porch that um, the landlord cut down and it was a tree connected to, so I could see the, from my porch and I love to welcome it and I would talk to it often. Um, and then this became a poem about something else, dangerous things. The tree in the backyard is dangerous, your landlord says, and must come down. You watch from your balcony when they start to take the limbs away. Nests knitted to the branches tangled together on the lawn. The workers point out all they knew was rot, its potential for damage. No one asks you, why would they? You don't know anything about trees. Don't even know what kind it is by the leaves. A week ago, this tree surprised you with flowers. White flags that smelled like your mama every time you walked onto the back porch. You reached off the railing and clipped a piece, brought it into the house. The flowers wept in the cramped heat of your kitchen. You should leave some things alone. Today, the workers are gentle with the nests. They cradle them before they bag them. You leave your mama's house before it's done. The surviving birds louder than the chainsaws swooping and shitting on patio furniture. You come back to the abandoned sky and the red face of clean cut stump. You think every violet gone belongs to you. Um, I'm gonna end with this poem. I was thinking about this poem because I looked at Emily's sun porch back there and I thought about how it was useful for her. Mm -hmm. Damn, I need a minute. Because sometimes survival looks like a sun porch crowded with living plants despite how much I've been told I can't keep anything alive. Every muscling green Knithing from the dirt, reminded me of my mama's tongue, blade up, a warning with roots. I'm learning to care for other living things and myself. I overwater my aloe and my liver. Forget my fern needs shade as much as my heart needs to sleep in the dark sometimes. Crowd my tomato plants the way I choke on thoughts of leaving myself. I kill them sometimes, I try again next season. I touch their new leaves when I can't sleep, whisper my worry because what will be left for my children? Who will take cuttings and grow them in their own rooms if this world is dead? I give them what I have, my voice, water, house in winter. I fill my sun porch with the living and the dead and I talk to both. I put soil on my tongue because I want to taste both. I remember how my mama said, I need a minute when she got home from work and gave her tired to a chair, closed the door to the kitchen to escape her screaming house and talk to her philodendron crawling up the wall. Like my mama packed a room with plants like gauze in a wound. I'm trying to know healing from the inside out filling a space with what I keep alive and what has kept me. I need a minute to breathe better in a room of reminders of my mama's cutting tongue. Thank you. I should have went first because I don't want to follow that. <laughs> Um, I want to thank the Emily Dukasa Museum for inviting me and I want to thank Allison 
for organizing our, our group. Um, I am going to read some poems from my book, Peculiar Heritage. And um, just listening to um, Kristen, um, I think it might be a theme of nature today. So um, these first poems I'm gonna read, a couple of them about the moon. Um, and, and these poems are from a cycle of a woman escaping slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're all looking at different parts of the moon. So the first one is called First Quarter. The moon tonight, two sides of me, I stare at the white side and let my eyes blur in tears until it grows fatter than it is. The pale pools over between the stars. I close my eyes and see a full moon, round as forgiveness. I cringe at benevolence towards those I've quit, enough so to make me open my eyes. On the other side, there is an absence of whiteness. The shadowed half of the moon extends silently across the sky, offering a muted possibility of not even forgetting. I lift it up into the darkness and unflinching, I go where I am, welcome to entertain the freedom to hate. Mm -hmm. Um, next one I want to read from this is um, Weenie Gibbous. So, so there's a little story with this this group of poems of a woman escaping and um, some abolitionists helping her. And this poem is kind of about the fear of putting trust into someone who favors the people who have enslaved um, you or who have hurt you for so long. Looks like a face turning slightly away from me as I'm still looking, still trying to figure out if this is a friend or if this is full or if this is nobody at all to be concerned with. And I can reach out my arm, my hand to touch her elbow, just the inner part where the skin is often described as soft as tissue paper, but I, I know the skin there is softer than that. I know the skin there is as secret as words, not even whispered. Words only breathe in the darkest of nights under a sky full of stars to nobody at all. Looks like a lie that was told to me when I was on the edge of dreaming, when I was young, when I was in the arms of someone I loved and trusted, but accepted the lie, and learn while eyes flutter against the weight of sleep, the difference between a lie and fib and story. Those who lie, I learn may love me. Those who fib, I learn are trying to trick me. And those who tell stories are nobody, nobody at all. <laughs> and not only, I, I wish I can, well, I can tell you like that no, who are you? Nobody, of course, I stole that from Dickinson, but also um, this, Poem depends on some hyphens, of course. <laughs> um, this is not about nature, this next poem. I guess if you think of hair as natural. Um, and I, I want to read it anyways, because it's um, an homage to my mother and all the mothers before me. Um, and I wore like the ring from my mother and my grandma to like have them with me today. So yeah. they're so far away from me. My grandmother is, of course, gone, but my mother's still around. This is called sewing season. Yeah. My mother's fingers thrip, thrip, thrip through my coarse hair. One over two over three, one over two over three. Thousands of ring circlets circling each other. Thrip, thrip, thrip. Thousands of times braiding histories of the women before her into my hair. My mother parts furrows onto the scalp beneath the mound of my woolly hair, scratching scree, she scree, charting rows of roads crossed by the women before her into my hair. My mother's fingers recall lineage of designs, cross continents, cross ideas, crossing cornrows, the rip, the rip, the rip, plating Africa into my hair. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read some insect poems. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one is called Phoenix. Um, yeah, okay. She smashed a gnat. 
or no see him beneath the, her thumb against the wall it left a smudge reminiscent of an ash made cross or a butterfly this delicate death she wanted preserved so took a cool eye lining pencil and outlined the shadowy new animal that flew its perpetual flight knowing that this too would smear would wipe away would morph again as she lived and as she slept my husband doesn't like that poem. He doesn't like that they're dead. She kills him. Bobby. She plays what it did, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read one more insect poem. This is called Lady with Impunity. And this is inspired by the fact that if female dragonflies don't want to sleep with you, they'll just pretend like they're dead. Um, <laughs> and I, I just learned recently, I think the same, I think it was frogs also will just like, I, I guess they don't have the words to say I have a headache, which is fine. <laughs> or um, I don't want no scrub. This is called Lady with Impunity. Impunity. I watch a damsel fly dressed in iridescent colors, confusedly careen around a green colored pond full of tadpoles in the verdant New England woods. I catch the glimpse of light traveling through her wings and follow her plunge through the surface of the water. She dips her pretty head in, clearing her mind or her path. Determined and certain, she springs from the still waters, causing a dollop of activity spiraling in her wake. I close my eyes and take hold of a wing. Denzel fly flies me away. And one more bug. And it's called not grass, weeds, and I'm just gonna read it. Emily, stay in Amherst, watch the train weave through the brush of Fitchburg. Fitzgerald, the American dream doesn't involve dandelion yellow or a sun-colored goat beard. And Tony, even jazz, even the desired blue of New England aster won't suffice. Maya, maybe the bird sings for untasted greens growing wantonly in our money gardens. And Phil, maybe this is the new pastoral. Long green lawns without a speck of color. Claudia, may the books brought to rallies be full of flowers and fruit mistaken for weeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to read some newer poems that are in that book. So, um, I'm obsessed with hair. Um, uh, let's go do this one first. Maybe I'll read that one. This is called Surfeit. Um, we had a rainy summer here in New England this year and a couple of years ago too. And I found growing in my yard mushrooms and mold that weren't supposed to be there. And um, like most of us, like um, Kristen and, and her poem, like, what are we going to leave our children? Um, I I worry quite often about what are we leave, leaving our children and what power do we have? And this is called Surfeit. Mm -hmm. This is where we are now. I dreamt of mold spreading throughout our house. It grew soft and bunny fuzzy white beneath dishes in the sink on the back of our hands. In real waking life, mold grows atop the moss outside because it won't stop raining. And when the sun shines, it's humid and hot. And when it doesn't rain, I imagine fungus, mold overtaking the mistreated earth growing between our toes or in patches of ringworm on our faces. We know the biggest organism is a kind of mushroom expanding underground, this amelaria, this honey fungus, covers acres and is older than the oldest tree or tortoise. This is where we are now, sweating in a deluge of hurricane rains, practicing the Sisyphean task of ridding ourselves of tenacious growth. How am I doing? All right. Um, so I'm working on a cycle um, of poems that are based off a song by uh, the bad plus called You Are. That's a song that sounds like it doesn't resolve. I'm going to read one of the poems from that. Um, that's about hair, too. I am obsessed with hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read it. I have let myself go. This is a sickness, and I need hand holding. My hair has grown maybe an inch when I wasn't watching or washing it. I let it grow. My various curl patterns whirl into each other across different sections of my head, 
my hair, not quite natural, collects more than cascades, goes upward on the sides I sleep on, forming a three-sided box of coils. It is winter leaves, tenaciously holding onto oak trees, browning and twisting in on themselves, hugging closely. You take me, you place me on the floor between your thighs, you work a right tooth comb over my head. You are a hairdresser. You are a healer. You are a mountain mover. You are godlike. You parting my hair, placating me. You are here for me. Mm -hmm. um, another. Okay. One. Uh, I've only. Okay. All right. I'm going to read a sonnet and then one more. Okay. Um, this is also for my collection. You are. And this is not published, but who cares? In this dream, you are an artist who works with colorful inks and liquid solutions and large flat vats. I watch you drop splashes of magentas, yellows, and blues in the liquid. I watch the ink blossom into spreading flowers, blooming until there is no space to grow. In this dream, you are a dancer who prefers your feet, bare and minimal design in your costumes, who prefers wearing black, and dancing against light backdrops. The music you choose is almost atonal, genre splitting, and elusive. Your hair is loose. In this dream, you're not in it. I'm not sure where I am. I'm outside of it. It is not quite a dream. And one more poem. Brought way more than I can actually read. This is called, um, well, it's, it's a poem after a painting by Jurian, Jurian Van Streek. It's called Still Life with Lemons, Peaches, or and, and the painting is of, it's an old Dutch master, and it's of this still life with lemons, but also this very black person wearing blue and just beautiful person. And I thought, looking at it, this person would loved, although they probably were an enslaved person. But anyways, um, just a, a beautiful painting. Still life with lemons. Lemons and peaches and blue and white granite ware, sage green grapes and leaves waning through the season, wanting walnuts, wine and gold inlay, silver tray, blue enveloping you, softer than indigo, your lips full as conquer grapes, plump as ripe fruit, eyes watchful, gold everywhere. You're from gold, your skin and your hair, you, Ebon Peach, you're still here. Thank you. I got um, sucked into listening so much and was enjoying it. <laughs> I forgot I was reading too, but <laughs> thank you to the Emily Dickinson house. I think we agreed earlier. This is a little overwhelming actually to be reading here and um kind of amazing, <laughs> you know, to be reading in her space. And thank you to Demisty and Kristen. It's an honor to be reading with both of you. Um, I think I always knew how much of an influence Emily Dickinson was on me intellectually in terms of my appreciation of poetry, but I don't think I really realized how many times I had made reference to her lines and her turns until I started to prepare for tonight. I'm going to start with a poem uh, called Honey. And you know, I always say about Dickinson's investigation of death that most of us think there's life, then there's the point of death, then there's whatever comes after the big mystery. But in her poems, she seems to expand that one point mm -hmm. so that there's a spectrum within there, like awareness of it approaching, awareness of the moment of physical death, and then the sudden awareness of consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the same about nature. When we talk about nature and maybe having grown up in a rural area, I'm thinking, well, geez, there's nature that grows despite, um, you know, despite man's interventions. And then there's nature that's wild. And then there's nature in its decay and all that stuff. So I too have some nature poems. <laughs> <laughs> this is one where um, it wasn't experiential as much as it was learning. It's called Honey. Um, and I, my daughter, when she was young, brought home a book from the library about how honey's made. And I realized I didn't actually know other than bees, you know, just vaguely. So I learned um, uh, about how it is. And it made me think of um, how uh, 
a, a haggis, the Scottish food haggis is made through the stomach of something. So anyhow, you'll hear in the poem, but I didn't know where I was going to go with this poem, but like Dickinson, I think it was um, the, the actual poem was the experience of writing it and discovering where it was taking me. Honey, of the sheep's four stomachs, which would we jar, which stir into tea? Abomasum, omasum, reticulum, rumen, amen. Cud does loop the gullet like prayer, and lettuce hem reticulum shares its name with the honeycomb's net. But for a throat flayed raw, who among us would slice the distended balloon, harvest its porridge the color of bloat, spoon it onto a child's tongue? Tell me how honey's different. Even bees, crocus drunk, split their nectar, guttering most flume-like into the loose purse of a second stomach, sweet syrup reservoir. Once back at the hive, each bee regurgitates its swill into the rapture of a waiting mouth. Gut to gut, so nectar passes in chains, the fury of 20,000 wings boiling off all water. And what do we produce? What sap? Bees profound necking falls beyond our French kiss, closer to the queer plunger of live birth. Yet in the dim thrill of evening, we advance. Why does a body turn inside out like a sleeve at the soft shock of lips unsealing, letting us in and out like a canal's lock? To those I have kissed, on granite stairs and idling trains, under a roof cut out to frame the sky. What passed between us? How did it harden? Whom does it nourish now? Um, <clears throat> I have a poem called What We Should Really Be Afraid Of. And I thought I was sassy when I started writing this because someone at work was complaining. This was the summer of, or excuse me, the winter of 2015, when in New England we had a, a like a philosophical level of snow, and um, and everyone was talking about it, kind of the equivalent of water cooler talk. And I I heard people talking about how scary it was and how dangerous it was. All that was true, but I thought, is that really the thing we should most fear? So I started writing this poem. What we should really be afraid of and kind of making fun of snow but then I got backed into a corner what should we really fear so <laughs> the poem had to go somewhere what we should really be afraid of one not snow not a single flake and not all of them at once not their nest their melting puzzle their instinct to insulate against heat not the storm even hard not when wind discovers rain let its cool mouth linger on the spine of a high mountain not the mountain, not the smooth mud that reassures its slope, it's not your fault. Not the thin white trees leaning into weather, they know what's coming. Portents, gray steam created and dissolved like an apology dripping down a bathroom mirror. Not the writer's hand wiped on a leg. Not spring, not another, not its vining pleated limbs swollen with the ink of a decomposing violet. Not the wasp who shudders the hive of its compound eyes just to live there again in that bloomy velvet, reckless, forgiving, drunk with altitude. Not the wasp's slender waist. Water in the stream below buzzes with struggle, a woman's hair tangled in an anchor. The thousand grasping hands of its rust remind us, pray that it holds. There are things to fear, you know it. The water knows too, the mountain, the snow, even before it falls. Boats floating for a time, wait for the sound of their narrow ribs to crack. A fat speckled spider sharpens in the shoe of someone you need. Bacon grease naps in secret cells. A woman's thumbs fumble a button, her organs shimmy at the wrong time, she tells herself it's music. Someone else pulls a brush through her daughter's hair. She decides she won't hear the steps in the hall, the key turning in the lock. He does it because he loves us. You do it because you have to. You do it because he told you. 
We do it because we're told to. In an attic, a man steps on something soft and tells himself the whole floor was covered with dead birds. So how could he not? But there was only one bird lying just where the man stepped. He knows. Through his shoe, he felt the long bones of the wing give. So I'm going to um, change it up just a little <laughs> <laughs> and read a slightly different poem. I'm fascinated by the way that um, Dickinson embraces abstraction. Um, and there's a poem I, I don't know that I've ever read, maybe one time, um, called Debt. And this is one, my husband too has opinions about my poems. <laughs> this is one that he likes, but I'll read it <laughs> for him, I guess. But um, I think I, I, I think with this one, I was trying to embrace an abstraction rather than run from it. And it's called Debt. And I sometimes think of the world as a kind of divine ledger, like, I got to do something good in order to kind of, you know, offset something bad or, you know, like the way you get lucky and then you kind of owe the world. So that's what this, the origin of this debt. The gray wave expects to clear our railings by the end of today. Its rhythm is patience. Cradled on land, then inhaled into walls, waters in business with a subtle moon. They have a plan, but won't tell. You watch the sea foam simmer from the middle story of a burning building. Its flames blow east the way everyone predicted. It was a matter of time. There was that night you fell asleep with candles burning near the drapes, the day you left a thicket of lint to choke the dryer. The fire forgave you then, but you owed him. Just as you owe the earwig who, for the third day now, waits in your phone's receiver pincers sharpening on the stone of their own mercy. You dial someone to insist the worst must be over. Can you hear him tapping? There's a message in his code. You're afraid of the wrong catastrophe. Mm. And I'm gonna switch it up a little. Um, Dickinson's poems, I mean, she called her letters or you know her correspondence with the world and so I think it's uh, interesting to imagine letter, you know, poems being written as letters to various people, specific people. And here's one I actually have that is a letter. It's called Letter to My Niece in Silverton, Colorado. Now, Silverton, Colorado is a tiny town, um, uh, you know, by Boston standards, I guess, of a few hundred people who live there year round. It's at 10,000 feet. Um, and uh, I have family who live there. So being so far away, you know, you have to spend a lot of time imagining what's going on with the people there. And so in a way, poems are love letters and letters to those people. This is Letter to My Niece in Silverton, Colorado. Someday you will watch your mother lean on the rim of the sink to wash dishes in a way she never has before. And you will wonder if she was ever young. I'm here to tell you that cars are so much quieter than they used to be. At a stop sign, you never know whose turn it is. It wasn't always like that. It used to be you could hear an engine from down the road and know whose it was and where it could take somebody. Your mother's hair used to be so light, it glowed. On the summer boardwalk, people stopped to remark. Men asked questions. It got to where we could hardly make it to the Gravitron before the line snaked back to the sea. Those days, there weren't so many metal railings. If your timing was right, you could get close to things. To the ride itself, pistons gasping so loud, you could almost see the thrust of greased air. To gears joining and unjoining themselves inside a dense black band. To your sister's impatient hand, chiming pink shells on a bracelet, new from someone we didn't know. She never answered them, just looked ahead and grabbed my wrist. Don't look people in the eye. It used to be that you got instructions. Then every ride began playing its own music. Your mother's white hair faded against the punch paper reams of old calliope, and soon no one could predict flats or sharps. I'm trying to say that waves used to roll in, then back out. That you could count on the moon to give off a little light. 
It used to be that idling cars might have stopped for the tide to watch it slide its wet hands up the day's sand line. But dusk grew tired of resisting, I guess. Or maybe the cars had always been waiting for us, waiting patiently for us to come to the window. If we got close enough, they knew they could stir the tiny oceans lapping in our shells. And I think I'll just read one more poem. Um, this one is not published in my book, but it is published at Quarterly West. Maybe it'll be in the next book, we'll see. This is the first one I thought of when I thought of um, reading anything related to Dickinson because it has an experience of an intimate encounter with death of the natural kind. Is there an unnatural kind? I don't know. Um, but this is actually um, a, a story of me um, holding my cat as she died in my arms. And there was something about Dickinson's willingness to go close to it and lean into it and like touch it and be there in a sensory way for it that I felt gave me permission. So this is my last poem, it's called Physics. There's some direct references to her lines too, physics. When at last you content, when at last you consent to sleep, the train retiring from day softs to a sag on the track just beyond your window, earth's baggy wiring stretched vast. Days ago, the last gasp of an animal you held rasped your skin, the breath of unmaking, its whisper stale, a soda can left in the sun, then cracked. The process was long. Your palm hammocked the hardening purple meat of her worn organs. Flocking oak boats knocked, crowding each canal. Heavy death's heft, heavier the air rushing in to fill its wake. Phones ring in an empty room, Ziploc bags film the counter waiting to be filled. A man shuttles objects from building to van. If given time, even fingernails curl into the impractical spiral of the cosmos. Miracles fall from the sky like cinders, but tonight you want no testimony. Let the fan drone in low Doppler. Let the night jar click its roulette. Thank you. <laughs> what a what an extraordinary gift for you all to come and read your work here tonight it, it is for all of us who uh, get to listen to it and thank you so much um I just want to kind of start by asking you how it feels to read your poetry in Emily Dickinson's parlor. What did it, what, what did it feel like for you? You both are looking at <laughs> mine. I'm sitting in the middle. <laughs> so I, I get distracted quite often. If you haven't noticed how much I tripped over my words, I was looking, although we took a tour of the house and this is probably like my third or fourth tour of the house. It's still kind of, I don't know, inspiring and also it just picks up your imagination you look around the room and imagine the people who have been here before you um contemporaneous with emily dickinson but also people who have visited home and who have lived here before it was opened as a museum and who have visited here as a, you know while it was a museum also you think about the writers who have been invited to read before you so it just it feels very humbling and um i if you think about our bios i am nowhere where um kristen and and allison are so i just You're constantly <laughs> that i i'm not worthy of, of the space of, of the podium you know plus i wanted to play the piano I guess. <laughs> we can have that as a bonus feature at the end <laughs> this is my first time at the museum um and the way i imagined it is completely different there's like a there's a i think that places collect energy um and there is an, an undeniable feeling for me of joy mm -hmm. there's like a lightness here that I didn't expect 
even with everything that went on in the house there especially in this room there's a lightness like there's this feeling of like good energy mm -hmm. um and there's all these details that spark imagination mm -hmm. and you imagine the life and the lives that were here before and that's why I love what museums can do and that's mm -hmm. what I love about old houses as well mm -hmm. is that you just imagine the life before you know it's interesting isn't it how like I mean I never made this connection until now but I'll often talk you know think myself and talk to my students about like how a poem has to leave room for the reader to do some co-authoring but if you think mm -hmm. about it you go to a house museum and the furniture is set up and you have to complete it with your imagination you know so it is interactive in that way um and i know upstairs we were all taken by the exhibit that shows the yeah. sliding uh the Very little slide choices to show yeah. different versions of dickinson's poems and i was thinking how recently I was talking to another writer about how even with published poems and pu books published, uh, excuse me, poems published in books, sometimes at readings will just like go off and rip and like make yeah. edit, edits. And yeah, I did that today. Yeah, did you? <laughs> and, so I love this idea that like her poems are alive because we don't have corrective versions and you know, it just feels like nothing's finished. Nothing, yeah. this isn't an ossified place. This is yeah. a very alive place, which is awesome. I think that's very much in keeping with the museum's philosophy, right? That we're um, we're kind of constantly making Dickinson's relevance, right? Because every new generation of reader, every new generation of poets reads her differently, reads her anew, makes something new of it, takes something new away. Mm -hmm. um, so when you all propose together, you you um to get married now. When you, when you all proposed to be part of the series, um, you three, you um, you wrote this really lovely thing um, talking about sort of, um, you know, the, the last few years impacted by the pandemic and the chance to kind of come out of that and consider your own relationship to Emily Dickinson. Um, and you asked a couple of questions. You said, are we building on her work? Are we overturning her work? Um, are we in conversation with her work? Mm -hmm. Are we working independently of her? Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of turn those questions back to you um, as you're as you're here in this space. And, you know, you all brought really wonderful elements of Dickinson into your readings tonight. Mm -hmm. How does she how does she kind of show up for you in your poetry? I, I think there's uh, I think it's a mixture of building and in conversation with um uh, those of us in English studies always talk about being and well in humanities in general talking about being in conversation with those who have written before us and who are writing alongside us um, so that that element is there but I also think building on it I, I truly believe that poetry is what it is today maybe you know someone would have came after Dickinson and Whitman but I think Dickinson and Whitman really opened up what we can do with poetry, mm -hmm. um, moved away, and there's nothing wrong with form. I write, I, I wrote, read a sonnet today, but um, to move away from form and explore, um, to discover things within um, just the language itself, instead of being um, um, limited, limited is probably not the right, right word, constricted by that form. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that we still play, I think we still play with language mm -hmm. and, and lines that way. And how do we stop and start and breathe in? I think our tour guide I, or one of you told me that someone looked at the dashes in Emily's work as, or Dickens's work, the <laughs> solid moments as um, um, rest and music. And, and I, I see that and I understand that. And then I, I feel that too. I can. Yeah, I, I totally see that. Yeah. Just yeah. the time to take rest. So building upon, but also in conversation with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, so one thing I think is really interesting is um, I love Frost, and I know not everyone loves Frost, um, but I was surprised. I went back and read that whole, his whole, everything. <laughs> and I read it chronologically, which I have since learned and have since done with Dickinson, really interesting to see a writer's development but mm -hmm. long story short early frost sounds like an imitation of dickinson 
<laughs> so, and then I also mentioned, I know to Kristen on the way here that I had heard, and I don't know, I wasn't able to verify how much, how likely it is that Dickinson would definitely have had access to this idea. That, but I heard that Poe, Dickinson's somewhat contemporary, had said the most poetical subject is the death of a beautiful woman. And Dickinson was like, watch this. <laughs> so I like to think of her as an innovator and we think of her as this spark, but she was also in conversation, you know? So she's thinking like, Edgar Allan Poe says, I have to write about this. What am I going to do to respond? And to and how am I going to navigate what's expected of me versus what isn't? And then you have Frost come along and say, well, they're both using the ballad stanza, you know, that storytelling thing, that old Scottish form. And so they're both using that. And so sometimes I feel that like haunting my poems because I know that they walk down that path too. I find that really exciting when you know that you can like walk over the same steps literally here someone has walked but then it's just like writing in meter or something you have to kind of figure out your own way to put your fingerprints on it so mm -hmm. i don't know are all poems potentially in conversation with other poetry i don't know it feels like that but she's such a huge force so i don't know yeah especially when you're you you read them when you were younger and like we think about how that became kind of formative to maybe our voice in unconscious ways yeah. um, because we like the way that they use language or that we like the way that they played with language. And so we maybe tried that on and maybe embodied that in our poems. And I think about also Dickinson in this tradition is like, she didn't know these poems were going to get immediately published or read mm -hmm. and did it anyway. And I think that that mm -hmm. is kind of a tradition, especially as a black woman poet, that I'm always thinking about. I write, yes, I write for others, but also I write for myself. Right. And I think that that had to be on her mind mm -hmm. a little, that this was art she did to keep herself whole. It's, it's interesting that she was writing without, like her audience right. were the people who got the letters right. or mm -hmm. no one at all. And I, I I don't know how many of us write with a, with thinking that no one's ever going to read this or this is for myself. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that could be very free. Yeah. Yeah. I want to welcome any questions from the audience. I'm going to look and see if anyone has popped in there yet with um, a couple of questions. And I think we have some. Um, Let's see. So I, I like this question. Thank you, Diana. Um, if you three poets know one another well, and she's suspecting that you do, <laughs> um, what have you learned about art from one another? And what do you what do you resonate fr with from each other and Dickinson's work? And it could just be something you heard tonight, you know. I'll go first for this one. I've admired Kristen and Domesty for a long time. I think one thing that hasn't really come up that much is Domesty weaves back in and out between prose and poetry. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to draw from different sources, like that kind of hybrid and collage effect is something that I want to rely on more. I want to do more. And I also love that I know some of your work is intensely researched. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which it's not just in conversation with other, and I don't mean this reductively, but other sort of aesthetic traditions, but also with alternative, like history writing. You know, I think that's really incredible and amazing. And Kristen, I think, <laughs> I don't know what is there to say about Kristen's poems that are <laughs> so beautiful. They speak for themselves, you know. But I think every time I every time I hear Kristen read, I feel like I'm hearing the poems lived out loud. And I always think you must be so exhausted after you read them. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm, you know, that you do so much in a poem to kind of recreate an experience with the reader so that they're feeling something in the in the present moment. And I feel like every time I read on the page or hear her or hear read Kristen's work, I feel like I'm there living that in the moment. Mm -hmm. These are not artifacts of a previous time. These are things mm -hmm. happening right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I I knew Allison and um, I have read her work before and excellent poems. And there's still some lines from that last poem. Yeah. <laughs> just like resonated in my head oh my gosh yeah um did not know, <laughs> i did not know Kristen 
prior to um, Allison bringing us together. And I'm glad that she she has because her work is very powerful. It's, it's very strong and just lovely. And I don't know how, I, I'm guessing that Kristen is a lot younger than me. I have no idea, but there are some, I, I don't know where she grew up. I grew up in Milwaukee. I had three empty lots in our backyard. Yeah. We'll play kickball, we we'll play hide go seek and other games and we'll eat wild grapes. So I just felt <laughs> like, I felt my childhood there because there there's a lot of similarities <laughs> right now there. Um, so yeah, and and I understand what you're saying that it is in the moment you just feel like yeah, yeah they're they're so present, they're so urgent. So I, I appreciate that. And what I appreciate, um, not only from your work, but both of your I hate to say energies all the time, but it's true. <laughs> like especially as women poets, we need we need connectors like Allison. Um, we need room. It's like Demisi, right? We need these voices. We need we need people who um are able to like bring people together and have conversations, not only about poetry, but the work that goes into making that happen with our impossible lives. And I think um I look forward yeah. to getting to know you. Yeah. Because I've had so much fun with you today in this limited yeah. space. As we were touring the museum and, and thinking things over. Yeah. 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 Allison was kind of a force. So yes. at the Boston yeah. Head, no, 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 no. <laughs> she makes us that write the questions. <laughs> <laughs> write poetry on the spot. Like I've done that with you three times. Now, That's right. Yeah. And I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to write. And poems. you always do. And I always do. <laughs> so, um, like uh, on demand, poetry on demand. And it's, um, she brings people together, so yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. I thought it was exciting <laughs> that we're all three women poets in Massachusetts, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it, when you cut it down, like we're all like a woman sitting at the desk at night looking at a page, a person sitting mm -hmm. at the desk, you know, yes. the desk looking at the page and being like, what now? Mm -hmm. What discovery is there to be made? And I think that's really mm -hmm. a, a neat way to connect it to Kinsel too. Yeah, I think when we thought about how to end this series, you know, bringing you three here mm -hmm. felt right for that reason exactly. <laughs> You're local. You're local. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Um, all right. So this question comes from Susan. What are your perspectives and experiences of choosing to write amidst great loneliness mm -hmm. and day-to-day -day chaos or duties? Mm -hmm. She's struck that in touring Emily Dickinson's house, um, how many people lived here and the the space and the closeness and the noise levels of that perhaps mm -hmm. um the daily duties that Emily Dickinson was mm -hmm. required to perform um so she's she's saying she senses loneliness in Dickinson's work and I guess she's wondering how she could feel that way in this bustling house mm -hmm. um so she wants to hear you talk more about uh writing amidst loneliness and and daily life um, I'm not sure if I would say like there are some poems that feel lonely with Emily Dickinson, and there are some poems. I remember being a kid, being told that there's a difference between lonely and alone, mm -hmm. and there are some poems that just feel more alone or insular, for lack of a better word. Um, I I don't know if she was necessarily lonely. It seems like she had, from what I know of her life, she had a very loving family and they were very present um but given that we are all I, well, i'm a mother you're a mother, mother. I'm not a mother. you're not a mother either, so, <laughs> but we all have lives outside of writing and and it is writing a lot of times is by yourself you are the one that is doing the work but eventually other people come in your editors um, with fiction as your agent or um, other people will come into the work and it is it's challenging when I first had kids. I, I have twins. When I first they first came along, it was really hard mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to write again, really, because you have these people like little vampires. It's time for them to feed. <laughs> um, you have to drop everything and feed them football. <laughs> but but it happened. You you find that space. You you carve it out because you you want to do the thing. You want to write. And I'm talking too much, but I I, I kind of think that writing 
gets us away from loneliness in some ways. It's, it's like, I don't know. I think it kind of makes us more part of the world. In, in yes. ways. Totally connects with that. That idea, like sometimes poetry and art mm -hmm. is the thing that brings me back from the brink of, of that, mm -hmm. that, that deep loneliness. Although I am not afraid to be alone. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I prefer it. <laughs> um, and sometimes I feel like feeling lonely can just be a condition of the human experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to settle and be in those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I kind of love that I can see that a little bit in the interior kind of um feeling of Dickinson. Mm -hmm. Um that like I'm not shying away from a feeling mm -hmm. that might be a little devastating for a moment, mm -hmm. but also very brutally beautiful. Um, well, so yeah. yeah, yeah. All the things that make us feel alone, yeah, connect us most. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about those things, you mm -hmm. know. And that's what poetry puts us in conversation with. Mm -hmm. Wordsworth has, has this line, Wordsworth, about um being in vacant or in pensive mood. And it's truly, I don't know that I ever feel lonely in that way. I feel reflective. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to over-correlate to Dickinson or whatever, but I, I feel like most of her poems express that too, not the friction of loneliness and the want and longing of loneliness, but rather the reflectiveness of, of, of being alone. Mm -hmm. And she also, I think she feels as, as I feel that objects are animated and natural objects are animated. Like she says in um, Narrow Fellow in the Grass, um, several of nature's people I know and they know me, I feel for them a transport of cordiality. Then she goes on to talk about who she doesn't like as much. But, <laughs> um, but I think for her, like she's among friends when she goes out. And honestly, when Kristen and I walked in tonight, we were like, look, it's a berry bush. Look, oh, I forgot what the other thing was, but we, it, it feels like there's these personages, you know, everywhere. And I don't think she was necessarily lonely, but I do think she probably actively, like muscularly created space for reflection, mm -hmm. which probably we would all like to do more <laughs> sometimes yeah. in our enough time to write. But it's a really interesting question. I it think. is, yeah. it is. And, and loneliness, you know, happens for everyone sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've been... A Massachusetts transplant for 10 years now and I still feel like I haven't found my footing where I live yeah. um and so there there are moments of loneliness and then you know that's that's where the humanities and the arts come in you mm -hmm. reach out to others through writing through reading through music through the arts um I'm a museum slut so this is the reason why I've been here <laughs> three or four times I go to museums all the time yeah. art um, historical just um, and that's another way to just connect with um, mm -hmm. with humanity. That idea of like muscling, you know, toward a, yeah. a goal of creating, a, yeah. carving out that space um, mm -hmm. makes me think about your conservatory poem, Kristen, mm -hmm. um, Sun Porch poem. And mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, you you were ascribing like living qualities and human qualities, mm -hmm. right? To these, mm -hmm. these plants that are teaching you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, it might have been that poem or it might have been your tree poem and you had a honey poem where yeah. you, you both were talking about starting a poem in one place mm -hmm. and not knowing where it was gonna end mm -hmm. um does that happen a lot for you is that like pretty standard practice for poets would you say yeah yeah I want it to happen, you know, because otherwise it's a lecture, exactly. you know, it, it was yeah. fast, right? No discovery for the writer, no discovery for the reader. Mm -hmm. fast, I think so, um, and so, yeah, if you're not going somewhere new, and that's why I love Dickinson's dashes. I feel like at a certain point she gets an idea out and then she dashes like, okay, I got that idea. Let me move on to the next thing. There's mm -hmm. this, there's this sort of like scurrying toward the mm -hmm. next discovery. But yeah, if there's, if there's, if there's not discovery and instability, then there is preaching, <laughs> you know, and, and I, that's not the kind of relationship I personally want to have yeah. with any possible reader, which by the way, we're talking about Dickinson being lonely. 
I think Dickinson had a really hyper awareness of a deep companion she had, which was her consciousness. And I think she was always in conversation with that consciousness and considering it, it was like her little shadow, you know, or like a little friend. And, and, and I think that that has to do with sort of how you write poems too, that you're always kind of talking to yourself about it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of dashing being physical. Like yeah. you yeah. made it a verb there with, with her, with her dashing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Huh. Just like rushing to the next discovery. Or something, yeah. Yeah. I think um, so. Mon Montaigne is that the essay, the father of the essay says, um, "Well, the word essay is like French word to try, right?" And the idea of essay is try to figure out through writing. And I think that can go to a lot of different types of writing beyond the essay because we are trying to discover. I think we are trying to figure something out. When we write a poem, mm -hmm. um, when we have a problem or something like that, I, I often go to poetry or fiction. Mm -hmm. It's very rarely that I would go to creative nonfiction because I, I feel that's where I lack the most writing essays, except for like when something really, I don't know. Um, so someone was elected president um, a while ago and I didn't know how to meet that with poetry and it, I I couldn't write poems for a while and, and I went to essays like okay try to figure it out through just writing about it without um without art and it didn't really turn out without art but um it it made me write essays but I think I do a lot of my figuring out through writing and yeah, starting with a question or that mm -hmm. like that annoying first line that just won't leave you alone, mm -hmm. but you have no idea where that first line is going to go. Mm -hmm. And maybe that comes hours later, maybe days later when you find that first line somewhere. Um, yeah, that's what I love. Just that annoying first line <laughs> <laughs> that you have no idea where it comes, that flash. And then yeah. we'll go, we'll see where this goes. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we won't for a while. Maybe we will come back to it when we're ready. I have often thought that that might have been a Dickinson practice, right? Like mm -hmm. those startling first lines. Mm -hmm. I felt a funeral in my brain. Yeah. Right? I mean, did, did, did those lines <laughs> yeah. just a, a, arise in her head and then the poem, the poem comes. But mm -hmm. yeah, those. I think that her first lines must have startled her as much as they startled me, right? <laughs> Reading that. Washing the dishes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. or arranging flowers or mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely well this will be I think our final question but it's a really good one so I want to get it in here um from Michael Dickinson wrote this is my and actually um, Dickinson's letters and this very poem I think came up tonight um this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me um and each of you seem to reach out in some of your poems to an anticipatory audience that may respond with something back maybe it's a poem maybe it's a letter but something back um and he's saying I think we all do this at times as poets so what responses do you imagine come as the result of any one of the poems that you shared this evening good question big question good question for Michael oh man oh my god <laughs> So um, with the poems That's that hard. we shared this evening, I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 like we we talk about writing in conversation, as I said before, but we also write for ourselves. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to imagine the audience, and I try not to do that in my writing. But when it's out in the world, I I do want people to reflect on it. I do want them to respond and interact with it. But you hardly ever see the audience except for at poetry readings, how, how they're going to take it and what they're going to do with it. Um, Allison's, um, yeah, Allison, uh, when you do the poetry in a spot and people come and ask for a poem, you do see that because you have this particular person audience in mind, you know, that's your audience. And each time I did it, someone cried. So it's, that's that's really powerful, but I don't expect that from the the other poems I write. So I don't know. Um, it's like it is a void. It <laughs> is a void. void. Yeah. What did I used to say in my my bio? I I write for black girls on front porches, wondering mm -hmm. where the aching in their chest is coming from. I used to be like that. Used to be my. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.
um, or the child that survived something. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe sometimes I imagine writing to that little girl of me um, that needed to hear something or work something out. Um, yeah. It's a hard question. It, it is, is a really hard question because audiences are so different and various. Mm -hmm. And what Demissy's talking about, the poems on the spot, I was there the other day when she wrote a poem and, and she that. was already moved on to the next one. And a person came and edged into the tent and said, uh, you know, touched her arm and said, I want you to know, I think touched her arm and said, I, I want you to know you your poem made me cry. And, and I think when that, the feeling that, and we both just took a moment, we, ourselves that are universal mm -hmm. sometimes it can be about saying I want you to see something different mm -hmm. or I want you to experience something we've all experienced but differently and that's to me the one thing I would say because I think I often talk to a version of myself too unless I'm addressing someone directly <laughs> sometimes happens but um I think the one thing I definitely would want to say I would hope anyone would get from my poems and all of these poems we've heard tonight is that close attention to the environment, to other people and to other experiences is an act of care. Yes. Yeah. It's like a verb to listen, you know, and to and to metabolize another person's experience and to kind of connect your own. And and I think that's a really important act of care that if not carefully safeguarded, it will it, like I think it's something to put it in positive terms, I think it's something that is a strength of us, you know, sort of socially and we need to safeguard. Mm -hmm. You so all of you at home <laughs> have played that part tonight and, um, and we thank you for it. And we thank you, you incredible, beautiful, wonderful poets. Thank you so much you. for being with us. What a way to conclude our 2023 phosphorescent series. Um, thank you so much, Kristen Hill, Misty Bellinger, Allison Adair. We hope that you all will go online, learn more about these poets, find their books and buy them, um, follow their careers. <laughs> um these are just uh folks to folks to watch i think um and we hope that while you're online uh if, if you uh would like you can check out the videos of the rest of this series if you are just finding us tonight or if you missed any of our programs since may all of those recordings are available online um as will be this one um and for those of you who are poets because i bet there are some of you who are. Uh, we want you to know that the Emily Dickinson Museum will put out our call for proposals for the 2024, how can that be, mm. phosphorescence series um, in the next couple of months. So if you're not already on our uh, twice monthly email list, we encourage you to do that. You can head to our website at emilydickinsonmuseum.org to join that mailing list or to make a donation in support of free programs like this one. Um, we just couldn't do it without you. We wanna thank all of you who may have already donated in support of this event. Um, we just wanna thank you all for being with us and uh, we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank and you thank you and a round of applause yeah, for the Dickinson thank House. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for behind the scenes work too. That's that right. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the cameraman. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.